I do want to kick things off for everyone on the call as usual. Hey, thanks for coming out for our weekly uh, guest speaker series. Um, tonight, as I'd mentioned before, uh, I'm greeting our uh, longtime MDM friend and a longtime personal one as well, Jesse Jowdry, who's uh, worked with us in many ways from uh, employing previous grads from his previous hats at, at uh, Acronym. I, I remember working with you even when you were at EA and I was at the Art Institute. Um, anyway, we go way back. Uh, Jesse's also experienced the MDM from being a project client, uh, bringing in a really interesting one, and I'll touch on that in a little bit. And he's also uh, helped supervise a project too. We did that VR um, rampage like Smash experience game a few years back that I remember you being instrumental in helping us with. Um, but anyway, so this is to say, super grateful to have Jesse here. Uh, one other note of acknowledgement for everyone on the call, I'm going to continue this. Uh, we do want to recognize that we are located on the unceded territories of the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the uh, Musqueam Nations. Uh, super grateful for that continued um, gift of being located and also always looking for ways that we can collaborate in meaningful ways, so being mindful of that. With that said, um, being in, you know, we're physically located in Vancouver, but many of us are located around the world. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, Jesse, especially thank you to you for, for taking the time and joining us from the metaverse. Uh, and that is gonna be one of my questions tonight. I wanna get your thoughts on that, but why don't mm -hmm. you kick things off with a, a quick personal intro to yourself and you now you can, this is show and tell time. You give us what you got. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Jesse, obviously. Um, I started at Electronic Arts back in the nineties um, and I'll, I'll go over some of this. I have slides, shock and awe. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll kind of talk about what I've, what I've done through my career. Cause I've, I've kind of broken it up into a few different chapters and, and, you know, these chapters that, that go from school through, you know, my first job with a big company to starting something kind of small with a friend and then kind of, this last one is a, it's a big Silicon Valley deal, right? It's a uh, VR chat is venture backed out of, out of the Valley. And it's the big, the big show, you know, startup wise. Uh, so, and it's in a big competitive space where when people ask me who my main competitors are, I say, Facebook, you know, and things like that. And th that's not a sentence I ever thought I would, say in my life and so i have this saying i had this saying i haven't used it very much lately but i use it with some friends of mine and i think this might be a good time to kick off a screen share if you don't mind any yeah yeah you go right for it that's um that's good nice it seems to be coming through the way to begin is to begin all right yeah, so you can see that good i can see it it's not my it's not my saying but it is one that i kind of took some you know, personal ownership of during certain parts of my life. And what it essentially means is at some point, you know what you're going to do next. You know what you want to do. You know what you want to accomplish next. And you don't know when to do it. And you don't know when you're ready. You know, and a lot of people say, well, I'm not ready now. Um, so I'm going to wait longer, right? Without any clear understanding of what it is that they're waiting for. And this saying is one of those things that says, you know, when you, when you're about ready, go, right? It turns out you probably do know what you need to do to accomplish what you want to get done next. Um, and the way to begin is to take it is to begin. Um, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Another way of saying a similar thing, just take the step and see what happens. Um, how did I know if I was ready? I, I can't say that I was ready. I, I probably wasn't, but I wasn't unprepared either. And there's a difference there where ready is kind of like how you feel. And preparation is something you can do, you know, on paper. Um, and, you know, this is why you're here. This is why you're at the Masters of Digital Media program and CDM is to take those steps to, to become ready. Yeah. And actually on that, I'm going to just give you a positive, but I'm yeah. also wondering on, on your steps, because you, before EA, you would have been, you, you were in university as well, right? Were, mm -hmm. You did, uh, were you in, in um, New Brunswick or in? The, university of New Brunswick. I actually yeah. have a slide. 
Oh, okay, I was getting ahead there because I was just like, we're all, you know, these are all students that are currently in a position, you know, up upskilling or getting getting industry ready. And I was just curious mm-hmm. if you were going to get there or not. But yeah, thanks for that. I'll let you get back to it. Absolutely. I wanted to give you a breather, a little pause. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I can I can just go. I can. Go okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is a, a shot from a Dr. Seuss book that I read to my daughter a number of times, called "Oh, the Places You'll Go," and it's basically that life is long. If you'd asked me what I was going to do with my life when I was 15, I wouldn't have even said programming or computers specifically. Um, I was doing that on the side, but I come from rural Nova Scotia and, you know, we didn't have an, a tech industry of any note at all or any real economy for that matter. So I figured I was just going to go get a job and, you know, game development would continue to be a hobby of mine that I'd nurture over the, over the years. Um, but instead, what's happened is I've taken these steps, these chunks, you know, the first one that uh, Denny just mentioned was my university, my schooling, and it ran for a certain chunk of time. And I knew when I went into it, what I wanted basically to get out of it, I wanted to get some capabilities out of it, but I didn't really know what was going to come after that. And then when I went to EA out of school, I knew basically what I wanted to get out of it, but I didn't really know what the next step I was going to take after that was. And so life will come at you in these chapters. And, you know, if you can figure out what you want to get out of each one, you know, you'll be, you'll be ahead of a lot of people who are just kind of coming in and kind of taking it as it, as it hits them. Uh, And yeah, that's what we're going to do. And the thing that you need to transition from one stage to the next is what I'm going to talk a lot about here tonight, which is credibility. And this is a thing I've been working on for a long time. It's like you need to be able to prove one to yourself that you can do the next thing in your life. And two, you might have to do it, prove it to other people as well. Um, and that one is, is kind of challenging. So One of the reasons we get, uh, you know, a document at the end of our education is because, you know, we've we've invested this time and we've learned these things. But a lot of people you encounter won't have time to get to know you well enough to accurately determine what it is that you know and what it is that you've learned. And so you've got this thing that says, ha ha, I have credibility. I have a piece of paper that says I learned these things. And that's a proxy for them, a shortcut for them to believe that yes, you in fact do know what you need to do to go on. So when you come along to someone and show them your document when you're applying for a job and it says, I can do this, they say, hmm, okay, yep, it says. And I've got these these numbers here that indicate to me how well you can do this thing. And that happens not just at the end of school. It happens not always with a piece of paper, often socially, often through references or by reputation as you go from one stage to the next. So when I left Electronic Arts, it was, I had to convince people that that I could make a game, you know, with me and a small number of other people with no supervision. And while I didn't, hadn't done that before in a professional capacity, I had all these years at EA that I could say, but here, see, here is my, here is my credibility. And then I used that experience to prove to people, publishers, uh, Capcom first, and a few others along the way that I could do what I said I could. Can I pause you there too for a second, yeah. Jeff? Because part of that too, because you touched on something that was important, the credibility and being able to, to speak to those credentials to get the approval to do the things that you wanted to do as far as getting funding from the publishers. But importantly, didn't you have to find co-founders or the team to also convince to do this thing? Like, mm-hmm. is that... So how did how did you absolutely how did you, how did you build that initial team like find those risk takers or co-founders and so the first project the first thing that I did um, starting acronym games was I a bunch of us who worked on the NHL product at Electronic Arts decided oh it would be great if we would go and make a game company and make our own games. Um, and we had a, a whole, there's a half a dozen of us probably who would sit at the bar and talk about how wonderful this would be. 
Um, and when push come to shove, me and one other person did it. And four of them did not. Um, they, I don't know, they, they didn't feel that they were up to it. Or uh, at least one of them wasn't really in the stage of life where he was still taking those kinds of risks. Um, you know, family, family guy, uh, fairly young compared to the rest of us. So that, that we worked together and that's how we formed our credibility. My partner and I, uh, funky swaddling by the acronym co-founder who worked with Daniel's the real name though, right? So yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, but I haven't, uh, I haven't heard anyone call him that in a good long time. No, I know. I, I, it's, it's funky. It's definitely, he lives by, uh, by yeah. funky. It's the, uh, but yeah, and, and, but that's interesting that. too. Again, from one, anecdotally, that you had the, you know, there's six of you. They're all like, great to do this. And yeah, some things like life getting away for some. It's too risk averse. I have, you know, already have a family, or and I got the stability. And I'm going to put quotes on that because people associate, you know, just because you're working for a large company, you have kind of a guaranteed job for life or something. You know, yeah, it's not, you know, it's not that really is not definitely not the case for sure. No, no, it's not. And then, but you and Funky did it. Right. Yep. And that kind of was your, if you're going to do it, do it, or, you know, for, you know, take that first step. That one was a very specific thing. It was 2004. Uh, Xbox Live Arcade was just about to come out. Um, but before that, there wasn't really a good compelling place for indies to go and show their work. Um, and so the decision we were put up with, uh, it was put in front of us, was like, one, is this something we, we ever want to do? And it was. And two, is it getting harder to do it every day? And it was. And so that became like, oh, I guess it has to be today then, doesn't it? That was like a, a, a kind of a big shock. And that's eventually how we made that decision. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to skip over school there and go, go to EA. Um, unless you had any specific questions about school, actually. Uh, well, so you, uh, so you did your, um, you went to the UNB, uh, you uh, studied computer science, so, so you went the programming route? I actually was an electrical engineer. Oh, okay. Um, so I uh, spent a lot of time in these buildings here. Um, this is the engineering and computer science department. Mm -hmm. And um, I went in, again, coming from Nova Scotia, like didn't really have an idea that interactive entertainment was something I could go into. So I went in for a good job. Um, and this is uh, engineering was uh, what was re referred to me. I had uh, someone in my life was a uh, uh, general contractor building houses and stuff like that. And I always complained that he had to go to the engineer to get his plans approved. And it was just a, a rubber stamp is uh, the way he said it, you know, and he thought he figured that was a pretty good way to get uh, a pretty good way to get paid. Uh, is that so what inspired you to, to go that route academically? I'm like, that was. Uh... Yeah, yeah, that's my that's my story for how I ended up in engineering instead of computer science. OK, um, but it was it was actually really beneficial um, later on in life, writing engines for um, Xbox 360 and PlayStation 2. Um, you know, really dealing with how the internals worked. You know, from an electrical engineering background rather than just a programming background, uh, was was super beneficial. Of course, you can get you can get a lot of computer hardware in computer science as well. But at UNB, it was kind of like the computer scientists learn programming and the engineers learn uh, fundamental programming like operating systems um, and the hardware. Yeah. So. No, that's cool. Like I say, that was the 90s. I guess I'm touching on it because I just wanted to scrape a little bit of the, 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 the educational background because I was thinking when you started building up that team, like I'm trying to remember where Funky's skill sets complemented or conflicted with yours. Yeah. I don't know what the... Uh, so we were both technical. Um, yeah. He was like AI and gameplay where I was more uh, rendering and kind of like hardware stuff. So yeah. I wrote the rendering layers and the audio system and he wrote the AI and animation and... Yeah, and I remember I remember you guys doing it. I remember the formative years, and I remember you hiring some of your first two employees. So, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. so Jody and and, uh, and we got um, Mandeep uh, from yeah. from you guys. And yeah. one of the things about him was uh, he in his demo project um, that he did at the end of his term, 
he wrote the engine, which is a dangerous, dangerous thing to do. And I wouldn't recommend anyone do it. But because he did it moderately well, the game was technically flawed, but the engine was not bad and it did get him his, his first job in the industry. Yeah. Um, but that is that's a dangerous going to the cred side too, like showing what they do. That wasn't numbers on a page. That was actually nope. a, a portfolio piece, right? That That is the purpose of the portfolio piece. The demo at the end of the term is just like, this is another way to a non paper way to demonstrate capabilities to, to people. Um, Cool. Yeah, right, and, I, did, I, did, I couldn't let you pass over school without touching on school a little bit. So. Mm, yeah, it's funny. At the end of school, I uh, I was going to take a job in geological survey because it was basically the only job in Fredericton, New Brunswick, I could find that even touched OpenGL or 3D graphics in any way because they did dealt with height maps. And just on a whim, I put my resume in on EA's website, um, and they called me the next day and started talking about flying me out for interviews. And I, I had already had a job offer from the other place, but I had to tell them, I was like, sorry, no, I'm going to take my chances on EA. I don't even know if I'm getting a job offer there, but I'm going to take my chances on it because obviously, like for someone who's as into this as I have been, I had to. Um, and the, was that your first move to Vancouver? Was that what kind of drew you to the, to the West yep, Coast? That's right. That, cool. that's, what, that's what got me out there. <laughs> my piece of credibility that I used for that was I, I made a mod for Quake 2, um, and I got it reasonably polished and reasonably fun um, so that like I could send this along with the resume and people with Quake 2, Quake 2 in their system could just drop this in and play it and like say, oh, yep, you know, uh, this is not, this is not uh, someone who, you know, uh, just got by in class and is just looking for a job now and they heard video games pay well or something like that. I don't know who would say that actually, but um, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, that was the, the piece that I used. It got me in the door there. And then my personal interest and uh, hobbies in video games and my ability to articulate what I was talking about during the interview process um, did, you know, benefited me well as well. And then I ended up here. I did uh, NHL and hockey games for a few years and this create player screen in the middle Spent a good long time working on that. Didn't and what uh, didn't... I wanted to do when I came to EA, what I my original plan, which I didn't stick to, was I wanted to be there for five years, and I wanted to learn how to make a game, you know, and then take that knowledge back to Nova Scotia, right? So that last part didn't happen. I didn't go home. By the time you know I I'd spent five years at EA, I was married. So that uh, that really throws wrenches in in uh, in plans to move across the country again. Um, and the other part, though, I did stick with. I, I was there for for um, for five years, and I did learn, you know, what I needed to do. And it was a difficult choice to leave. But you'll hear a lot, you know, in in game development these days about how big companies don't really care about you and how they don't have your best interests at heart. And that's kind of true, but kind of not. It's true that like that they care about their bottom line, but there are ways to make yourself contribute to that bottom line that mean like, oh, this person is helping the company's bottom line. Therefore, I do care about them, right? Maybe not personally, but they care about the job you're doing. And that is something you can trade. It's a valuable resource and it's something you can use to benefit yourself in, in that environment. And I think that my time at EA is one of the most valuable and quickest learning times that I've spent in my whole life. I learned to ship product. Like the, the, back then, you know, I got NBA on here. This is before they skipped a year. You know, they would ship all these things every year without fail within three weeks of their intended launch date. And that that's a hell of a skill. And I put in a lot of time. I did work ridiculous hours. I worked 101 and a quarter hours in one seven day period. Mm. Um, I worked every day for a month. You know, that doesn't seem so bad these days. Um, but yeah, at was the, that the 
infamous EA spouse letter time, you know, where, where that this is before, of, well before that, yeah, before that, yeah, led yeah. To EA has yeah. gotten actually a lot better. Like, there's there are there are worse people in the industry for for labor than than them, but yeah, in in these situations, there are still things to be learned. Like, you have to decide for yourself what your priority priorities are, right? If you want to start to have this these years i was young i was single when i started here it was it would made things a lot easier I'll, to be frank right i had time to spend on these and i wanted a good career in video game development i wanted to advance and stuff like that and that took extra effort and i put in that effort and i think it it's paid off um but you have to figure out where your balance is and not it won't work the same for everybody but if you have time to invest and if you have aspirations that require you know more than more than normal advancement, I guess, is a way to put it, then they want something in return for that, but they will give you that in exchange for more effort. You know, uh, I'm not going to get into, um, you know, all the all the issues that happen around the industry, because some of them are, you know, when you don't have a choice, I, I don't agree with that. I, I agree that, you know, um, there shouldn't be a situation where somebody is pressured into that. I think that everyone from from different sets of priorities, I think the industry benefits from having everybody on board, even if they're working 40 hour weeks. Um, and that, that happened to me, actually, after, like I said, by, by the time I left EA, I was married and I wasn't putting in ridiculous weeks anymore either. EA noticed and they didn't exactly you know, reward me with the same pace of progress that I had earlier. And that was part of my decision to leave. Mm. Um, but it was also the right time. And when I left, I was able to convince a co-founder that I would be a good you know, person to carry half a company. Um, shortly thereafter, we were able to convince some publishers that we were, you know, a good company to invest in for some Xbox Live Arcade titles and some some Wii titles, and I ported Monkey Island to the PlayStation 3, which was, you know, it was actually a lot of fun. I, I hadn't played that game all the way through, and it, it aged really well. Uh, we did some high-end Unity titles, um, uh, Family Guy Online with Roadhouse Interactive, um, and this game over here, Wipeout the Game for the Wii, it was, was a ridiculous success for Activision. They gave us almost no time to do it. And very little money, and it was a it was a throwaway game. They didn't expect to have any success, but we made it silly, and it was buggy. But you couldn't help but laugh when you looked at it. Um, I think the best review of it I ever got was from from Giant Bomb. This is a very accurate review. Um, Vinny and Ryan from the Giant Bomb played did a quick play of it. And at the end of the quick play, Ryan turns to Vinny and he says, I had a great time playing this shitty game with you. <laughs> and it was like, awesome. <laughs> yeah. It was the best we could hope for with six months to develop it in. Uh, and it sold, you know, really well uh, under, under NDA. Mm -hmm. um, and so... There's um, a lot of the stuff that we did in Acronym wasn't game development, though. There was a lot to running a game studio besides just the mechanics of making games. You know, uh, a lot of it was just the, the, the dog and pony show of going to publishers and with demos or with you know, previous experience. And it was this, this thing of, of trying to prove credibility um, and trying to you know, make people listen to you and work with you and give you a good deal. Because um, like I say, Wipeout the Game was a, was a smash success, success for uh, Activision and it was a much smaller success for us. Um, you know, that's the way the, the work for hire publishing business works. Um, but there was a book that I wish I'd read at this time and I, and I would recommend this book to anybody in just about any situation, but certainly someone who does negotiation on 
in any frequency in their life. And it's called Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. It is an incredible read. It's the only audio book I immediately pressed play on when it finished and started over again immediately. Um, it's, it's so insightful on, on negotiation. And negotiation was a big part of, of, game develop, or of running a, a game development studio. And also, actually, that's, that's a good point to give you a breather here too, because I've seen it many times with, you know, we have passionate content creators or people that, you know, that want to make things, but the, the biz dev side, the actual sales, the, you know, it, it takes a, a whole lot of effort and of your bandwidth, your time. Um, so in those early years, I mean, I guess, you know, it was on you to, to wear those hats while also being the CTO and. Yeah. And, and that, that is one of the things that separates companies that succeed from companies that don't, it's not like they expect you to know what you're going to have to do when you start your first company. Like when you talk to a publisher or something like that, they don't need to know that you've got it all under control right away. They do need to know that you're going to sit there and figure it out. Right. And that goes back to the initial thing of, you know, the way to begin is to begin, right? You don't need to know the answer to every question, but you do need to know that you're going to have patience and, you know, willpower to like say, oh my God, like what, I'm negotiating contracts now. Like what, what is that about? Like, can't, doesn't my lawyer take care of all this? The answer is like, not unless you pay them way too much. Um, you, you know, after a couple of years of it, you will, you will be reading legalese and doing it yourself without lawyer review and like being able to do that is you know one of the steps and then after acronym games i took a little time off which was really nice because that's when vr was just starting up and i was like really well positioned with uh you know no real obligations or nothing to to get myself out of at the time um and so I had been working with some avatar technologies. I had like some, you know, some avatars I could wear in a, in a, in a static environment. And I had downloaded some models off the internet. Don't tell anyone. And I had a, you know, a, a room full of these models. And I said, wow, these, these are like super, super compelling. And then my co-founder for VR chat, Graham built the prototype of the social experience. And I'm like, oh my gosh, these two things need to come together. And so we started working together on this prototype for VR chat, where I put my custom avatar stuff in and, and uh, merged it into the social product. And then we did custom environments because I just felt strongly that, that the, the metaverse, if you will, needed custom avatars, not just an avatar maker, but fully custom head to toe. Um, and I wanted to make that happen. But then Facebook bought Oculus. And it's like, oh, crap. Like, we are on the verge of something really, really big. Like, we're, we were really kind of like one of the only experiences in social VR, the day social bought VR. Mm -hmm. And I have my suspicions on what product they might have showed Mark Zuckerberg to make him interested. Nothing mm. confirmed. I wish I could mm -hmm. confirm yeah. that. Uh, and so we started VR chat and we just, I, I said like my, my partner's a, a young guy. Uh, he was in college at the time and he was, he was, he was unsure. Like he, he didn't know what kind of opportunity this was. And so I got on the phone. I'm like, like, I'm not going to promise you this is going to succeed. In fact, it still probably won't, but it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. It's a lightning strike, a new, the emergence of a new medium uh, for, for interactive entertainment. It's like being there when cell phones launched and, and kind of having a foothold. It's just like, it, it comes around once, once a decade or so at, at most. Um, and obviously VR hasn't taken off like cell phones have, but it is doing okay. And the growth is slow, but, but there. Um, and we're very lucky to be a huge part of that growth. 
Um, some of the things, some of the decisions we made earlier on, like head, you know, head to toe avatars, um, were not the the wisdom of the crowd back then. People were saying head and hands is all you need, and that like legs on avatars that aren't tracked look weird, which they do, but no one cares is the key. I was right? gonna ask because was that your wipeout moment too? Did you embrace the humor or the 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 you know there must absolutely have been some- yes like. VR chat is also occasionally buggy. Mm-hmm. We we've we've taken the big the big problems like how to get tons of these things in a room and how to do it on a mobile platform like the Quest uh, Oculus Quest and the Quest 2 um, in a way where all these people are emoting with IK. Um, and yeah, we 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 did something big and silly and people look at it and and laugh even though sometimes it looks wonky. Um, but the avatar thing in particular, like I, I just didn't understand what people who wanted to do head and hands avatars were on about. Like when, when I go to the, I don't go to clubs anymore, but when I did, I spent a lot more time worrying about what I was wearing than what other people were wearing. Right. So they were all saying, well, head and hands is enough to perceive that there's another person there. And it's just like, is that the bar? Do I want to know that this is another person? I mean, I do want to know it's another person, but is that as far as we want to go? How much of an avatar do you need to feel cool? How much of an avatar do you need to feel pretty? Right? There's like so much more to this than just like, oh, I can tell that's a human. And I never, never understood that. You know, I get it for like single player games where when there's no real point in looking down, you might as well be a disembodied hand or gun in the environment um but in in multiplayer and i think that quite frankly i think that the the world has spoken you know they they like the full body avatars as well um very few people in like a social environment are still have their head and hands or you know and or are they're, they're transitioning out of it as fast as they can um and then the other thing we did that was super risky was we started with only smooth locomotion, even though smooth locomotion made a lot of people sick. And when we came time to develop like a teleport like mechanic, we actually have you point to a location in the room and your avatar walks there. Like you don't get to teleport and you don't get to like come back to where you are or cancel the movement. And like people say, well, isn't that basically teleport, but more annoying? And the answer is not to everyone else in the room. To everyone else in the room, you are a normal hu- human walking you through an environment like normal humans do. So it's verisimilitude, you know, that like people buy it. They get the space they're in. They understand this is this is real and these are real people. And you can talk to somebody while you're moving slowly through an environment. And you cannot talk to somebody while two people are trying to blink teleport through an environment. <laughs> and so... You know, that as well, I think most, many experiences these days are adding um, smooth locomotion, at least as an option for them. Mm. Now, here again, there is a lot to learn about launching a social product where your competitor is Facebook. Um, I would uh, definitely like to point out three of them. I read a fair bit, uh, you might be able to know, but like there's three things that really kind of help at this this juncture. Uh, A book called Crossing the Chasm which is essentially about taking an early stage product with a a few fans that like suddenly reaches this point where it's really hard to acquire new users, even though not that many people are using it, but the the mass market just isn't adopting your product yet and how to get across that, that chasm between the early adopters and the mass market. Um, The platform revolution is a book that is mostly is very applicable to uh, VR chat um, because it's a user generated content and it, uh, platform. And it, it just talks mostly about like the differences between making your product yourself and allowing other people to make your product for you. Like the, the worlds that people go to in VR chat are all user generated except for the boring home environment that you spawn into. And there are worlds in there. Uh, a, a, a guy did a like a murder mystery. Uh, it's a short social deduction game where one of you is the murderer and he's the only one who can pick up the knife. 
And one of you is the inspector, and he's the only one with a gun. And you, you know, have to find clues throughout the house to, uh, to get, you know, power ups for, for the other people while the murderer is trying to kill everyone. And it's got, usually it has more people in that room than other popular VR games on Steam. Right. So our, our rooms are more popular than the whole, than whole games. Um, and not, not always particularly close margins. And the reasons for that are that you, that it's something you can do in your identity. You know, you show up, you're hanging out with friends, you go play murder for a little while, then you go do something else. You go to a club, you listen to some music. We've got a, a pretty good um, underground DJ scene going on on Friday nights now uh, where people have built these clubs and some really good DJs perform there. Um, to to packed houses uh, but you can do that and you can go play murder and you can go somewhere else all with the same identity all with the same friends you can go jump out of an airplane or do like completely fantastical things as well well i got a few uh, but questions it, on this like first first of all i mean that's awesome and again that, that, that the ability to, to to go into all these different you know worlds within your world right which is super cool we even have a course called building virtual worlds but yeah we we had a a, a second life version of the the of our mass for the program before we actually had our building which is kind of mm-hmm. uh, and we had there was djs playing in second life and all that jazz and it's uh but i'm thinking like you know how did you scale like what what server like you know how did like again the, the, <laughs> you know that's with great difficulty no um problem. so we had in 2017 we we had a meme uh problematic you know but a lot of people showed up to check it out um, you might have heard of Ugandan Knuckles. Um, so we went from 200 concurrent users to 20,000 mm. in a couple weeks. Uh, and everything fell over. Uh, and then we dropped back down to about 10,000 and never looked back. We never went below 10,000 again. Um, you so know, the we're, we're the up in the kind of growth. What's that? The meme was the catalyst for the growth, like that brought the audience in. And Absolutely, they- it was all re- we were already growing that that in that time, but it was sudden, and we jumped two orders of magnitude in in users, um, and that has kind of been like that's not the first time, that's the only time that you know um, something like that has happened when um, when jeez. Oh, What's the, there was, there's a famous hotel uh, that Trump tried to, or Giuliani tried to speak at, but then it wasn't the hotel. The gardening, it was like the uh, yeah, yeah, the Four Seasons or something like that. The Four like Seasons. Yeah. Yes. yes. Somebody recreated that place in VR chat like the day after, and we had tons of people just come drop in and to check it out, right? And and uh, and just to see what what the place looked like. And uh, after Among Us came, you know, really big, somebody made a room that was like Among Us. And I was going to ask when you were talking about that murder scene, I was like, there, there's got to be an Among Us in, in VR. And like, just based on that earlier analogy you had with the detective and the gun and the, you know, mm-hmm. like, yeah, that's cool. There's, there's, there's enough content there. We have like 7 million uploaded avatars, I think. Um, it's, there's a lot of, a lot of activity there and like the, we're getting to the point now where discovery is one of the huge problems we have but there's so much good content that people can't find that i don't even know about that i've never seen it um yeah <laughs> at, 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 i want to point out this this picture here on the top right which is at twitchcon one year we went there and uh only our chief creative officer actually went there and we didn't really have any plan, but over a couple hours managed to arrange a live meetup for VR chat fans. And this is how many people showed up in, in a park outside just randomly on the day. Um, and, uh, you know, he, uh, he had some t-shirts that he threw to the crowd and stuff like that, but there's, there's a lot of interesting identity experimentation 
going on in VR chat and you know everybody kind of knows that like a social environment is uh sorry an online environment is a a good place for someone with any kind of social anxiety that you know that they can deal with the environment a lot more easier than a crowded room um but i i want to this this is one story of somebody we get thank yous for people like that all the time they say like you know i i can't believe my life has changed i have a great group of friends and all that but this one story really got me which was somebody who said i went into vr chat not able to talk to people i learned to do that and now i can do it in the real world too and that to me was like okay right because there's always the concern that like that you're you're just that this is a one-way deal that you go in and you don't get anything back and i want people to get something back from this and like that was that was a super powerful moment for me and we have the same thoughts for for you know what we want for the user generated content too like it's nice that people are building this content content for us but we really want them to get something back as well. Um, you know, we're moving in that direction and we'll have more to say on it soon. Awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and this is interesting because one of my goals for VR chat, like I said that each of these things kind of broke down into a goal. And when we were contemplating going to the Valley, we had to put in, we put in our own money. We, you bought all of our first equipment and we kind of lived on our own dime for a while. And I said, this time I want to learn how next time I don't have to put in my own money. Right. So I get, get enough of the investment thing um, to you meet people, understand how that process works so that next time, you know, I, I can just start there rather than doing the, the early stuff over again. And this is again, what I was talking about at the, at the, at the start is that I don't, I don't know what's, what's next. Um, that was actually a real typo. I just decided to keep it. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I don't know what's next, but I kind of know what I wanted to get out of this round. And I think I did. I'll find out at some point. Um, and and I'll try to set up a goal for that too. Like maybe maybe next time it's a little bit more balance, or maybe it's uh, maybe it's just kind of a being on the board of a few things or something like that. I don't know. But uh, you know, when that time should come, I'll 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 do that. Um, and I've got two, another two books I'm going to recommend that I hope will kind of be valuable in this stage uh, of my career. One is Creativity Inc. Mm -hmm. It's um, by, oh, geez, the guy, one of the guys at Pixar, the, the technical guy at Pixar. And it talks about essentially how they run their creative teams and how they start with a crappy movie and, you know, beat the crap out of it until it becomes a good movie. Uh, and while still letting everyone in the process feel empowered and creative, I think this is something that, that big business video game development doesn't do particularly well. Um, while there's a lot you can get out of a big company, creativity isn't it. That's more of an indie thing. Um, and this is a this is a great book about that. And the other another one is Start with Why, which is uh, it it talks a lot about having a vision and a mission for what you're doing. And VR chat actually did this pretty well too. I got into VR chat because I had beliefs about the way the metaverse should go. And the people who believe those things came with us. Right. And it wasn't like, it's not a cash, a cash grab. It's not like we think, Oh, this is going to be, I talked about how this is a big opportunity and stuff like that, but that's not why we did this. We did this because when we when we didn't know it had a future because it was something that we believed needed to be done and if you can start with a belief like that it's like this is something that the world is wrong about that i believe there's an there's an opportunity here for me to help change 
if you start there, you will always find people who will follow you. Right. But if you start with like, I want to do what they did only a little bit better. I don't know. The people who like what you do already like them and you're going to have a hard time pulling them away. So find out what you think the world is wrong about or what you think needs to happen and, you know, start telling people what you believe and then they'll, you know, you'll be able to find some people to come with you. Um, and I, I want to step back just a little bit. And this one's, you know, a little you know, on a, on a down note, this is, you know, this is one side of my life. This isn't all of me, right? This is my professional, my professional environment. And I like the way my professional environment has gone. And I like the way the other parts of my life have gone too. Um, but the key here that I want to get through to you on this slide is that none of the stuff I just described all the way through that is going to make you happy. None, no accomplishment is going to make you happy for more than a passing amount of time. Enjoying the journey is what will make you happy. And I feel, I feel that if you can take that time and, you know, do the things, set the targets that, that are going to make you happy, set the targets that are going to work within your life at your phase of life, you know, you've got a, a, a much better chance because um, the job alone won't do it. <laughs> and I'm going to recommend another book. It's called The Happiness Advantage. It's incredibly uh, insightful on this subject. It talks about Harvard. It, it, the, the author went to Harvard and um, he is often asked like Harvard, wow, you must be ecstatic. Like the people there must be, must be, you know, so thrilled and stuff like that. And it's like, these are the top 1% of all the schools in the United States and they came here and half of them aren't even average. And it kicks a lot of people's butt and they get down. And the observation he came up with was if you look at the people, the successful people aren't happy, the happy people will become successful. If you look at their grades, that's the way it goes. And it's a, it's a very insightful book on that topic. And I recommend it to anyone in any job, in any position. It's a, it's a decent way to think about life. It works in relationships too. Um, so yeah, that's me. Hey, thank you so much again. I mean, for, for all of this and, you know, the, the, the true story, the behind the scenes and and it's hard. I mean, it's like you've had the, you know, you had to run the gauntlet and I mean, it's both as a founder and, you know, the personal journey, like, you know, trying to balance those hours, the commitments, the passions, the, the home life, right. It's mm -hmm. uh, those some challenges, but, you know, and I know you're setting up for that. You're already talking about that next venture setting up where you don't have to go in, but I think you're doing all right on this one. You've got, yeah, uh, yeah you know, for pretty sure. Good, pretty good spot. It's but I, I, I did want to, I mean, ahead of this call, you were mentioning you've got some roles you're looking to hire to free up some people. Like, can you tell us a little bit about what kind of roles you look for within VR chat? And because I want the students thinking about, the, you know, their future, what they can put into their portfolios or what mm -hmm. roles they could be thinking about and how we can help you out. Yeah. So we, uh, we just uh, got our Series D financing round, which is uh, really great. Um, that is great. Might be public. <laughs> we're growing the team over over the next few years with, with not all that money uh but some of it um and like right now we're hiring web developers we're hiring back-end and api developers to help with things like scaling and accounts and security and things like that we are hiring client engineers unity unity engineers um and uh, designers, we're hiring uh, community community management people. We're trying trust and safety is something that we uh, are seriously investing in in the near future. Uh, you know, 
you're passingly familiar with VR chat, you might know that we haven't always batted a hundred there, but it's something we do take seriously and uh, are trying to improve on. Um, yeah, it's, you know, most across the board. The one thing I'd say is that we have, because we have so many users, we get a lot of resumes from the community and we bias in that direction. People who understand the product, understand the space, have opinions on things that we've done um, and things like that pretty much always get the edge over uh, people who don't. So, you know, familiarity is a, is a product familiarity is a, is a good thing to, to have on there. Actually, that kind of leans into Simran. Hey, a good question on that. So, you know, the idea of no experience, you still have time to get it, right? So it's the, you know, being able to sample the product, you know, if you're, you're really going to, you know, buy in, that's probably the best, um, you know, advice. Yep. We've, we've hired people pretty low, right. For getting into VR chat too. For... Uh, it absolutely is. We handle most of the tough stuff for you. Um, like as far as building an environment with like multiplayer functionality goes, it's, uh, it's really simple because, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do the multiplayer part. All you need to do is kind of wire the few things together. Um, and we, ha we have hired out of the community. We've hired people who are creators either to be, you know, developer support or, um, you know, to help us put together tutorials. And some of them even, even to, be, to come on and do like real product work. Um, we have a scripting language we call Udon uh, because it's based on, you know, nodes with noodles between them. <laughs> yeah. um, but then one of our community members who is a, a pretty good engineer actually, built something called Udon Sharp, which is essentially a compiler from C Sharp into our own interpreted language. So it lets people write in C Sharp and and put that straight in, into the into the app, which is which was insane. I, we knew we had a good scripting language, but being able to just create a component and drop it on an object and then hit run and it works. That's that was awesome. awesome. So we have another question in chat here. So it's the, what, what are the roles that des designers play and like what skills are you looking for in the designers in the community? Right. Um, design is, is something interesting. So our chief creative officer, Ron Miller is his name. He was a designer at Blizzard back in the early days. Uh, and when I say early, I mean like Vikings hmm. uh, early. Um, so bar, our bar on design is pretty high. Um, most of the time we've got, uh, five, five years experience or more. Um, the kind of exception to that is really motivated community members that we've hired into, onto the team. Um, people who've, you know, been active in our discord for a long time, people who take mod roles, um, things like that. People who have, I don't know, eaten and uh, slept and breathed the product for a long enough time. That it's like, oh, wow, this, this person really knows this stuff and start, start off in a community role. And then once they're on the team, they've been able to prove that, like, okay, actually you have good instinct for this as well. But I mean, to go back to the credibility thing, that, that is for us, one of our key bits of credibility is is product familiarity. Um, how is VRChat different from Facebook Horizons and why is like a big, a big thing. How is VRChat more popular than Facebook Horizons when you look at the scale, the scale of money that went into each of them, right? It's, it's not a fair fight yet still, yet yeah. still here we are. And where I don't even know where, where they are right now. Um, That's awesome. And, and again, I, you know, I'm, I'm a huge I'm fan of the David and Goliath um, stories here. And obviously I'm rooting for the, for the homeboy. So that's my, you know, it's a Jesse, keep up that fight. I do, again, in the interest of time, I'm going to jump in with some of the questions so we can get, get there. But I know um, Robert, uh, he's got a question. I, he's going to ask it on mic though, so we can cover it here. So Robert, I, I, just see, uh, I wanted to ask more of a, uh, more of a, I guess, half personal, half professional question. Mm -hmm. How did your perspective change when you went into EA as a programmer? And then obviously afterwards you decided to kind of shift away from that and go more into the, more into the startup space. Like how did your, 
what I guess if you if you were to do your why back before or during the EA, you know, times, how do you think that would have changed, if at all? And uh, so like, like why I was at EA or? Well, uh, I guess I'm just wondering because I'm kind of, uh, I guess, because I feel like I'm in a bit of a similar situation. I want to get into, I guess, you know, AAA game, game development as a programmer. And, and then, but I also kind of still feel like this little, like I was a little inkling in my head of like, maybe there's something else after, you know, something like big. So how, how did you go from like wanting to be like, okay, I want to work in EA and this is, you know, what I'm going to do as a coder. And yeah. then, okay. I think I, I think I got you. I'm gonna I'm gonna try and answer here and tell me if I tell me if I got it right. I always thought of of programming and game development as a creative outlet. I'm primarily a creative person. EA wasn't necessarily the place to do that. I was a coder on sports games, neither one of which kind of leads you to be like a creative lead. But EA for me was a phase. It was like something I went into knowing it was gonna be time boxed. And that when I was done that, I wanted to move on into the next thing. I didn't like to go to the credibility thing. I didn't think I could prove to anyone that I would be able to, to do an indie game on my own at the start. Even myself, I didn't like I've got like, hobby projects and stuff like that, but that's not the same thing as shipping, shipping product. So I didn't feel prepared to do that. And so I said, what do I need to get prepared for this? And the answer was five years in a big institution that start teaches you how to do that stuff. Mm -hmm. And the lack of creativity in that time was just a sacrifice I was willing to make along with the, you know, some extra hours to get what I wanted out of it. If you can keep your eyes on what you want to get out of it, it, uh, it makes it, makes it all part of like a, a long continuous story with a beginning, a middle and an end. Actually, Hopefully not an end. Uh, you never know when that yeah, when that is, but hopefully like not. Yeah. You, you basically you go, have to go into each of these projects assuming there's going to be something else afterward, and this is going to be a just a chapter in your life. Okay, well that's very insightful. Thank you. And I, I do. I mean, I like your perspective on the time box or going in with a goal or kind of looking at what that time and may may look like. And again, you had that objective of taking the business back to Nova Scotia or something, and but you pivoted I and mean, life, you know, minor, you still made yep. your exit and started your company and found your co-founder and like, you know, all these things happen, but you know, it's, uh, it's good to have that in mind. Now I'm going to ask if somebody like, if, do you ever ask somebody where you see yourself from five years? And if they say, I'm going to start a company, like uh, what's, what's your perspective on a, <laughs> an employee's answer to that question now? Right. Um, where do you see yourself in five years, Jesse? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, so I, I personally don't know. Like I, I have basically only decided when is the time was right to move on. Right. So I'll just keep my options open for now. Um, it's definitely like, I, I have more ideas than I know what to do with. Like I've got a, I got an ML project that I think would be kind of cool and might be able to sell to Google, but I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I've got like other things talking to a friend of mine who's in film production and, you know, he's having a hell of a time getting his assets into, into Unreal. And it's just like, yeah, hmm. nah, I don't know. Like, I, and I won't, I won't decide um, until, you know, either I'm ready to leave or yeah. afterward. Yeah. yeah. So one of the questions, so, I mean, you're obviously still here in BC, uh, Port Coquitlam, right? There's, uh, yep. So are you working, is it a fully distributed team? Like, how is that working? Yeah, we are fully distributed. Like, my partner is American. And that was like, as much as I uh, kind of maybe glossed over going to the Valley before, that was actually an important part of it. Having somebody, he moved to San Francisco for three years while we kind of got started. And he dealt a lot with the investors and the pitching and things like that. And having having someone able to do that was really, really awesome. Cause I couldn't do it as a Canadian citizen. Do you mind sharing um, that antidote about age in the Valley? Or, uh, oh yeah. Know, yeah. The, the Valley is also, uh, can be a little ageist. Um, you know, don't know if you can tell, but there's a decent amount of gray in here now. Um, and, uh, so I spent the first few years that I've going down there, I colored my hair, you know, I, I did. And I, I probably knocked five, 10 years off my apparent age and it was helpful. Um, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's one of those interesting antidotes because it used to be age is experience and wisdom, and but now it's like the youth is where the you know that the, that's it, it's, it's 
my my learnings on the valley are definitely one of the most important things that I'll take with me from this to whatever happens next. And the valley is a and it's it's growing now. I mean, especially with COVID, but like um, even before that, people were kind of branching out. You didn't need to be headquartered there anymore to um, to you know to get valley investment. But the way they talk about investment there and the way they talk about business plans and risk was eye-opening and you, you everyone knows this in, in kind of a high level right and they, they talk about they want facebook's and they want you know unicorns and move fast and break things and all these all these things you hear and we've seen the social network and and stuff like that but to actually like see some of the crazy stuff that that gets money it really is the situation where what they want is um hold on one second okay um is a, a slim chance of a huge win and they don't care if you can double their money they're not interested like you you got to assume that like you got to assume that they're going to want to tell this story at a party to another silicon valley investor right and it's got to blow their socks off right or they're just not going to tell the story mm-hmm. and that they're not going to invest their money but also there's the side of this, which is like the difference between a business like VR chat, where we've got a product and we've got growth curves and we've got multiple years of, uh, you know, customer acquisitions and retention numbers and things like that, as opposed to a place that makes one game and releases it and maybe supports it for a bit and then moves on to another game and releases it and supports it for a bit. Like a hit driven model like that is almost uninvestable down there um you must have like to work in that in that area you have to have a single product with with growth as its objective um because uh, the hit driven ones you know they 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 only survive until their first real bomb and then they're out whereas uh, if you're if you're just taking like let's take League of Legends for example, League of Legends is a business because it's it's something that they you know put standard growth mechanics against that they do email blasts and they try this marketing method and they try that marketing method and they measure the success on the numbers and they run their analytics and things like that. Whereas if they were um, you know and you can look at those numbers, you can say this is going to be around in this many years because it can't drop off that fast. Um, and you know they've obviously made a ton of ton of cash with it, um, but those those types of conversations and the way to think about what is a business and what is just a company that uh, that makes product is I don't know it's it's a it's a thing I wish more people knew, hmm. and I'll 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 talk about till my you know till my well you know and that's the thing I I I'd love to keep this going and and for but we're also closing in on the seven o'clock Jason so teaching game design hour. Um, any of you have to drop off on that, please do now because I do not want to get the wrath of Jason Elliott. Um, but if there is you know one last question or so, I think Ugo, you got your hand up. So I mean, Jesse, if you're cool with it, we'll we'll stick around uh, yep. for that. But uh, I know others do have class. Go to class. You need to learn. <laughs> and then uh, yeah, but Ugo, go ahead. Ask your question to Jess, and then we'll we'll let you get back to your evening as well. So. Yeah. Hello, Jesse. Um, yeah, coming from an engineering background, um, when you got a job at EA, how were you able to, did you experience any form of imposter syndrome? And over the course of your career, um, how were you able to maneuver in a different field coming from an engineering background too? Yeah, imposter syndrome is is definitely a real and interesting phenomenon. I think like the thing is that everybody feels it. And I, I, you know, you talk about when I was at EA, I don't know, no more than I do now. I still do like, like with everybody, I think does it. And that I think is one of the ways I've been able to kind of put it aside is like, uh, you know, Dennis here probably does too. Like, He's been in this industry a hell of a long time and I've known him forever. (laughs) And like, you know, it's, it's just a fact of life is I think it's, it's just, 
people always just kind of recalibrate to wherever they are. And this is one of the reasons that buying something doesn't make you happy long term. You'll just like, you know, the accomplishments that we get and the things we do will give you a bump, stuff like that. But then you're, you'll just recalibrate yourself up to that. So we set ourselves up to these standards and then we surpass those standards, but then our standards just rise. And then we're back on back on the line again. And every, and like every second thing we do is good. And every second thing we do is crap. And, you know, so I feel it. I don't suffer from it, I guess is the thing, because I kind of say, if everyone's feeling this way, that guy's not acting like it. Like it probably doesn't benefit me to act like it either. And uh, so I, you know, probably talk with more confidence than I have. That's the truth. I, I, I'm certainly the same way. I'm, I'm an introvert who does these kind of things. Like, it's like when I was a kid, I wouldn't order a pizza on the phone, let alone like call radio station, request a song <laughs> or ever think I'd be teaching in front of a class or speaking in front of an audience. Mm -hmm. I still hate that to this day, but I mean, I do enjoy these moments and it's, uh, and you know, you created this really cool world that, uh, you know, it's, it's, proved helpful to, to not only the community, but that great story you shared with us. And uh, you know what, thanks for sharing your story with us tonight. So I am gonna end it here folks, cause it's a long day for many of us and Jesse included. I don't know if you've got a, a plate or a snack that came in off camera <laughs> or something, but I'm I'm not far behind you. Better, so. a beer. Uh, even better. Mm. Hey man, that's a, that's a, um, <laughs> I totally get it. So thank you again, everyone, for tonight. Thank you, Jesse. This is awesome. I'll get you a copy of the game tape to review at some point here, too. But um, awesome. anyway, thank, thank you all. Till uh, next time, stay in touch, Jesse. And we'll do, we'll do a beer. We won't even do coffee. We'll do a beer. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Good night, everyone. Catch you later. Right. Thanks, Jesse. Thank you.